Hello, welcome to Lessons of Vietnam. My name is Bill Dixon. I'll be your host tonight. We have a special guest here tonight with us, John Cope from the North Carolina Museum of History. He's going to be with us. We're broadcasting from the worldwide studios of Nissan Communications. Uh, th thank you all for tuning in. I uh, know you're going to enjoy the show. Uh, while you're enjoying the show, I've got some work for you to do also. I uh, need for you to call in and ask questions if you dial 919-518-9773, or even better, go on to Skype. That's Computers 2K Voice. That's 2 is in 2, K is in Kilo, capital. And join us and ask questions and come up with a question that John can't answer. You know, ask him something. Uh, whatever you want, to, anything you want to do to embarrass him is okay. He, he's a good guy. Uh, but we're going to be talking about what he does at the museum and some things they've got coming up. Uh, not always Vietnam veteran uh, tied in, but some good history stuff for people who uh, we were just talking about. His title is, uh, what, what is your title? Uh, uh, currently Curator of Militaria. A mili uh, curator of Militaria. And I know that's a new word for most of y'all out there, Militaria. But that's okay. Uh, case any of the Marines are out there, that's that's the curator of military things. Just want to make sure that I got that across. You know, just um, it is a big I, word. Uh, it is and Marines too. So yeah, uh, gyrenes or whatever. All right, but we want to um, uh, get going in just a second. Uh, go to the next one. Yeah, several. All right, we can just anyway. I'm gonna go ahead and start. Uh, the show is, uh, of course, the um, uh, covers everything that was in the 60s and so forth, late 50s. Uh, I just was reading an article recently about when the Vietnam War started, and there's only about eight or nine different dates for the Vietnam War started. Uh, so you can just kind of pick a date from 1954 right on up to uh, the day it ended, and it's still some question about the day it ended. Uh, some people say the war ended in 1975 when Saigon fell, but if you ever go to the Vietnam Memorial Wall, you see some people who were uh, on the wall that was killed after Saigon fell, part of that Mayaquez uh, situation. And uh, John, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, you, uh, you told me that your father, where'd you go to school? Let's go and start that way. Uh, I went to uh, Florida State and graduated with a history degree. Florida State with a history degree. Where are you from originally? Uh, my dad's uh, military, as we talked about. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was born in Frankfurt, West Germany, okay. um, back when it was West Germany. And uh, we, my dad was stationed there before Vietnam. Okay. Uh, and so we, uh, we were there when I was a baby and then again in the 70s. Now, I believe he's a Vietnam vet. You've told me in the past. What year? Do you know what year he went to Vietnam? Yes, I do. Uh, he was there in both 68 and 70. In 68, he was with the 3rd uh, of the 506th, and uh, in 70, he was in the 3rd of the 327th with Beckwith, um, both uh, doing long-range patrolling uh, with the 101st. Mm -hmm. 68 was not a good year to be there, uh, but was he with Colonel Beckwith? Uh, not at the, in 68, but in 70. In, 70, okay. uh, in, in 68, from the research that I've done, uh, he was near uh, Hue uh, after the Tet Offensive, uh, and then he was also in the Aishaw Valley later that year, which, from what I understand, was a very difficult place to be. Uh, it, listen, any time you were with Beckworth, you were where the action was. He was uh, quite a character there. Uh, so you went to uh, Florida State, you got out of school. Uh, How did you end up in Raleigh, North Carolina? Uh, well, I've had kind of a, a nomadic existence, uh, setting up exhibits in, in different locations. Uh, and at some point, I was looking for a new place to live with my um, soon-to-be wife. And we cast the net widely through areas that we'd, I'd worked in, and, and Raleigh was one of the ones I had some strong connections to. And we moved here in 95 and have set some pretty deep roots. And you, what, you've been with the museum since that time, or I worked at the Natural Science Museum for a few years first, uh, and then uh, worked at, moved over to history in 2000. And so I've been at the uh, history museum since 2000. Yeah, well, the history museum does some really good work. Y'all do some good work over there. Uh, you. With your curator of militaria, uh, tell us a little bit about what you what you do over there and so forth. Well, in general, uh, as a curator, I, I work uh, with the military collection. 
Uh, we are constantly exchanging different exhibit spaces in our uh, galleries and uh, using that military content to tell the stories of the North Carolina veterans and the history of North Carolinians in, in conflict uh, throughout the, the time period that North Carolina has existed. Uh, and North Carolina being a big military state with some of the main bases in the world here, mm -hmm. uh, it is a quite a bit of uh, military history going here, going back to, uh, well, before, long before the Revolutionary Certainly. War, going back to uh, the days of uh, being the first child here, the, one of the mm -hmm. first colonies here, uh, which is the Lost Colony, I believe, was one of the first outdoor dramas ever to be done. That's correct. Um, so that's one of the first. Also, um, uh, first in flight, as they always said on the uh, license tags, which we had to argue with Ohio about that. They were trying to claim them, even though they flew here. Uh, so we've had a lot of a lot of history in North Carolina going back to the military. Uh, being your father was in, was the military, it kind of fits right in. Uh, You've got some uh, displays coming up, some real special events coming up at the museum. Why don't you go ahead and, and start, and I believe you have a presentation to kind of show us a little bit about uh, what you've all got planned, and then we can kind of uh, fill in questions and so forth along those lines. That sounds good. Uh, first slide, please. Next slide. Great. Um, well, the museum is... Uh, responsible for collecting and preserving the history of North Carolina. Uh, I work specifically with the military collection and uh, try to tell the stories of veterans um, through not only the history but the artifacts that they've uh, come home with uh, in, in the conflicts they've been involved in. We have uh, content that uh, goes all the way back to early contact with the Indians uh, in our Timeline Through History exhibit. and. Um, And, uh, and so uh, we are able to uh, help people understand the history of North Carolina. Um, we are downtown Raleigh. If uh, you have not come to our museum before, near the legislature building and across from the Natural Science Museum, uh, we'd love to, to have you come down and, and see what we have uh, in our exhibits. You're pretty close to the Capitol. Yes, very close to the Capitol and the Vietnam um, Veteran Memorial there on the Capitol grounds. Um, we're often involved with the Vietnam Vets uh, North Carolina Vietnam Vets Association to uh, to help with that uh, um, remembrance and the special events that go on with that. Um, you know, one of the questions that I'm always asked about uh, our military collection is why should I go to the museum? Some people don't know what, what we have. But we've got uh, the Story of North Carolina exhibit has, as I mentioned, military con um, uh, content all the way from first contact with the Indians to, to modern uh, day. We uh, also have the Call to Arms Gallery, which covers specific North Carolina veteran stories throughout uh, the different conflicts. And then we also have Carbine Williams Workshop, which is, he was a, a North Carolina inventor that was involved with uh, some of the development of the M1 Carbine. Uh, while, while you're there on Carbine Williams, mm -hmm. uh, where did he do most of his work? Uh, he was actually, well, he started his work in uh, uh, Caledonia Prison, um, but uh, we'll get to that in, in a uh, few okay. more slides. All right. Uh, but uh, at, at first, we, we can see a couple images of the uh, uh, Story of North Carolina exhibit, specifically the uh, Revolutionary War and the Civil War galleries. We have a great deal of content there discussing both of those, those sections. Yeah. And what we're doing, basically what you've got there is telling the North Carolina story mm -hmm. uh, in the military. It's not glorifying war or anything like that. It's just telling uh, the story of the North Carolinians who, uh, from day one right on through, and the things they did and had to, had going on and so forth. That's correct. It's uh, um, very uh, oriented towards the North Carolina human stories uh, and the the actual history. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things we have there is the Alfred May collection, which was a uh, gentleman who was a sergeant in the 61st Regiment of uh, North Carolina, and uh, he spent a significant amount of time in eastern North Carolina as well as near... Um, Charleston at Battery Wagner. Uh, he ended up in Richmond and then ultimately at the Battle of Bentonville. Um, the, his entire contents of his haversack and um, shelter half were left in his family's attic and were found 70 years later and were brought to the museum after a cold call to the front desk. 
So it is one of the uh, neater things to find all of the objects that this gentleman brought home in essentially his duffel bag. Uh, uh, he was that he was Civil War. Yes, correct. And so he fortunately survived the entire thing, and and uh, we were able to get some of his things conserved. The uniform that you see to the left hand side of that image was in significant tatters due to moth damage, and uh, it took a considerable amount of conservation to get it back into a presentable form. Um, so, carbine. Uh, this is. Uh, Images of our call to arms gallery, and specifically one of the gun cases in the Civil War section and our World War II Navy section on the right. Uh, we try to cover most of the aspects of the individual um, services through the uh, different conflicts as we have objects for. Some people will ask us, why don't we have something on display? But it's often because we don't have any artifacts that, uh, that will help tell that story. And that's one of the, the things that we are always in constant search for. Um, the 30th Heavy Separate Brigade, which has a storied career all the way from uh, World War I, uh, was collecting actively for us in Iraq when they were there in the uh, mid-2000s. And so we have a neat collection of their things uh, in our modern warfare collection, uh, including things like their, um, the storyboards and um, other information technology that were, were used to try and con converse with the Iraqis in, in their language through pictographs. Also, uh, pieces of bomb-making equipment, which is ubiquitous with that uh, conflict, uh, as well as um, Saddam Hussein-era artifacts of uh, their military service uh, that were captured in Kuwait during the uh, invasion of Kuwait. Uh, okay, and now we're here at Carbine Williams' workshop. Um, he is a notable North Carolina inventor. He uh, was responsible for some of the development of the Winchester uh, M1 Carbine. Uh, with his short stroke piston invention. The image that you see on the left is of Jimmy Stewart and uh, um, James uh, Carbine or uh, talking to each other and holding an M1 Carbine. Didn't Jimmy Stewart play his part in a movie about Carbine Williams? Jim Stewart uh, played very, Carbine Very good uh, memory. In fact, that's the, uh, it's a press photo from that era. Mm -hmm. Uh, as you can tell, Jimmy Stewart's about a foot taller than Carbine Williams, but it probably worked well on, on the uh, big screen. Uh, but yes, he uh, he uh, had some notoriety in the 50s and 60s through that movie and uh, kind of rode his fame during that era to uh, to great success in, in the, the local um, military and gun show uh, circuit. He was uh, renowned in, in the state as well as in California and Hollywood uh, during that time. Uh, it's, a good, it's a good thing that the uh, warden of the prison allowed him to uh, uh, work on it and, and gave him the facilities and so forth to work with. Well, it's a totally different story as far as uh, firearms would be. Oh, it's very true. Uh, he was very fortunate that um, the head of Caledonia Prison, um, Warden Peoples, uh, felt uh, comfortable enough with him doing the work on, on the uh, um, guns of the uh, prison warden and the guards that uh, he allowed him to continue that work in the blacksmith shop. Uh, in fact, he said that if uh, Mr. Williams ever used uh, a gun to escape, that he would serve uh, the rest of his time personally. Uh, that's a pretty strong statement. It is a strong statement. So he's, he spent most of his uh, work time in that um, shop space in, in Godwin, North Carolina. And, <clears throat> and uh, so we received that in the 70s as a, uh, a lump gift of all the artifacts and guns and, and related equipment inside of it. Uh, and it was set up in the original archives building and then now in our current building, um, set up just, just as he left it. Uh, we like to kind of think that he's just gone to lunch with his, uh, at, at his house with his wife. And if you'd like more of that story, just uh, get the movie. I believe it's called Carbine Williams. In fact, or something it is. like that. And just uh, and watch the movie, and uh, you can probably find it out there on uh, Amazon or someplace. And I think you'd enjoy seeing the, uh, the story of it. Uh, and we have uh, several cases worth of, uh, full of guns, both the ones that he built in the prison um, and also uh, the M1 carbine and his various inventions. Um, he held about 60 patents at his death, and uh, several of them have been used to um, good effect by gun companies Winchester, Remington, and Colt all uh, used his patents for um, pieces of their equipment uh, Ultimately, there were successful um, commercial firearms. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so what we have coming soon, uh, especially very soon for, for us, is the World War I exhibit. It opens in April, uh, and that'll be 6,500 square feet of content uh, focused on the North Carolina soldiers' uh, life from recruitment all the way through the trenches and, and beyond. Uh, and then also generally covering North Carolina's involvement in the war and, uh, and the impact of the war uh, in general. Um, that will open in, in April, as I mentioned, and uh, we're looking forward to sharing that with people. They have about 3,000 square feet of built trench that will um, be an immersive environment, uh, including multiple uh, cases full of artifacts that were collected both at the uh, towards the end of the war, our original... Um, director of the museum was an uh, ardent collector and uh, very aggressive in collecting things as they were coming home from from uh, World War One, uh, as well as some of the uh, war, the Civil War things that we have that he was collecting from veterans as they were looking for longtime homes. So all the exhibits won't be in the museum then? Um, well, all of the all of our exhibits kind of rotate, and so some some are up there now, and some will. I'm just thinking out. about the trenches. That's uh, the trenches will be there at least through the exhibit, and we're talking about uses for them after the fact mm -hmm. as a more long-term military exhibit. Uh, we may take the call to arms content that is currently in glass cases and try to swap it over and get more mileage out of the World War One cases and, and trench system that we're building. We need more space. We do need more space. We could really use a whole new mu museum um, uh, because we have lots of great ideas for exhibits and just only so many places to, to put them. One of the things that we're looking at doing in 2018 or 2019 is an actual Vietnam exhibit. Uh, and uh, so we are starting the development of that soon, and we're starting to look for artifacts to uh, help to tell that story. So if someone has artifacts of World War One, World War II, Korea... Vietnam, uh, Gulf War One, Gulf War Two, Afghanistan. Uh, this is the man you need to talk to. Uh, he'll f put it to good use. And uh, all, in fact, that's one of what, part of what we're talking about tonight is uh, uh, getting all the artifacts. There's a lot of stuff laying around that uh, that your grandparents had, or your great grandparents had, or in, been in, the in a footlocker somewhere in the garage or whatever. Look through there, and if you find some uh, some stuff, uh, give John a call at the museum, and he'll be glad to talk to you about it. And uh, I, I think an artifact with a story behind it's even better. It uh, generally is the best way for us to to be interested in an artifact, uh, specifically to have a North Carolina history story, uh, uh, either a veteran or somebody who is uh, from North Carolina or sent or settled in North Carolina afterwards. Um, it is our mission to try and tell those stories. And so if it can help tell that story, we're interested in it. Right. Sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead. That's okay. Um, we do many other things that people don't necessarily realize about the museum. We do outreach, um, kind of like what I'm doing tonight. Uh, I'm always willing to talk to folks about uh, the museum's mission and, and uh, our interest in, in both the artifacts and firearms of, of people's service. Um, and uh, another thing that we do is... Uh, artifact conservation assistance, uh, generally giving people advice on what the best way to, to take care of artifacts are um, and, uh, and any potential um, hazards that you have to look out for by the way that you may be storing things currently. Um, we also have an online database of all of our artifacts that's accessible on our website and uh, so that you can search our, our exhibits to or uh, even the things that aren't on exhibit for uh, interest in, in a specific area. Do you have a look a place there for researchers who are doing researching a book or or history or whatever? Do you have a facility there for researchers to see some of that stuff that you can't display? Or? Uh, we, we have the facility to show people the things that we don't have on display. And, and uh, if somebody found something in our database that they were interested in, we'd do our best to, to make it accessible. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a staff library that has some books that most places wouldn't have access to. Uh, but uh, for um, research into documents and such, the archives, that, which is catty corner to us uh, across the street, is probably the best place for that. They're, they have the access to a lot, great deal of of all sorts of journals and, and um, state records that uh, we use regularly to uh, develop our exhibits. Yeah, that's an interesting place if you get a chance to go to archives. Uh, I have been there and uh, done a lot of research and actually saw some of the uh, pay records of my great-grandfather. 
Oh, well, that's really uh, neat. Back during, back during the War of the Northern Aggression <clears throat> mm -hmm. and so forth. I mean, n northern people call it the Civil War, but there was nothing civil about it for us here. But um, uh, Well, it sounds like I should be interviewing you. No, you go right ahead. Just, <laughs> you're, the, you're the expert, so. Well, hardly that, but I'm, uh, I'm learning as fast as I can. Um, so uh, we are actively trying to get uh, a 20th century artifacts, Vietnam fitting squarely in, in the middle of that. Um, we do have some uh, Vietnam uh, artifacts, but our depth is not really up to snuff to, to truly tell the story of, of sacrifice and, and effort that was done there by North Carolinians. Um, we would love to, to talk to anybody that, that has anything of, of interest that uh, you think we might be interested in. Yeah, North Carolina lost 1,600 during the Vietnam War. Uh, 39 of, of uh, 1,600 are still unaccounted for. The family didn't have closing. Uh, and I know out there there's a lot of artifacts uh, that have been put away. Uh, and the thing about it is if it's up in the attic, that heat does not do it a whole mm. lot of good, uh, especially uh, documents and so forth. That heat will uh, really do. So if you think that uh, you have a relative that was served in Vietnam, uh, and you might have their footlock or something, uh, look at it and see what you can find and give John a call. Uh, I think this is going to be a great opportunity for an exhibit and uh, help them out down at the museum because uh, you really appreciate the museum when you're there during the day and all the school kids come in. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it gets a little uh, crazy in there sometimes. I, uh, all the different school buses come up with, with the kids and so forth. But we always talk about uh, our, how hi important our history is, and this is th these guys at the museum. They uh, they take their job very seriously with the, with the artifacts and stuff forth down there. They have some fantastic displays. Unfortunately, they don't have enough space, but we'll have to talk to uh, our new governor about giving us some more space, maybe. Uh, but um, uh, John's doing a good job down there. You need to help him out and uh, look for those artifacts and. and Give them a call or take it down to the museum, and I'd be glad to work with you down there. I'm going to quit interrupting and let you continue on. Oh, well, that's fine. Uh, you know, I am only one of a team uh, of people that is, is working in the museum on, on not only the military things, but on the conservation and protection of the things that we have. Um, so if it's something that's uh, um, of interest to other curators or, or other people in the museum, I'll make sure that that, that is where they get uh, directed. Um, we have a, a lot of very professional people at the museum that are working hard to try and preserve this uh, the state's history uh, every day, and so uh, we certainly are, um, you know, looking through plans to to possibly have a different building. Um, there are several thoughts about that, and not only downtown but also potentially in the Dix um, Dix uh, uh, property that has been recently acquired uh, by the city. And so those, those are all things that are, are uh, in the future development. Um, currently, we work with partners uh, within the archives and historic sites, as I mentioned. Uh, and then the North Carolina Military Histor Historical Society is a, a group that I'm involved with to help um, broadcast the interest of uh, North Carolina military history. We also are working with the National Guard and their National Guard Museum, which is um, getting ready to be... Uh, uh, a, a full-blown museum on Gold Star Drive over by the Joint Task Force uh, building uh, as they get funding for that. And then also the uh, North Carolina Vietnam Veterans Association, which I've been um, proud and pleased to, to work with. Yeah, just think about it. If you, uh, if you have an artifact uh, of, of, that we've been talking about and you donate it to the museum, uh, several years from now you'll be walking through or your grandchildren can be walking through and say, look, that was artifact that was... Uh, uh, donated to the museum by my grandfather, my great grandfather, or uh, whatever. Uh, that's something that they carried in the war, and all of a sudden, that uh, the pride of, of having something like that is on display. Because if you got it in the footlocker somewhere, it's not doing anybody any good, uh, and and, it's, and age is not helping a whole lot. So, uh, great. I, I can't think of anything that would be more exciting. Uh, I have two grandchildren to be able to walk through uh, something like that as fine as the North Carolina History Museum, John, and say. Mm -hmm. My grandfather was in Vietnam, and that's the that's something he donated to the museum. That would be uh, very special uh, to my uh, grandchildren to be able to do something like that. And I'm giving the opportunity out there to our audience to uh, do it. Even if you're not in North Carolina, if you've got some ties to North Carolina with artifacts and so forth, 
uh, give them a call and uh, uh, we work something out, but uh, uh, it's getting it here, whatever, take pictures, so forth. But then if you're wherever you are in the United States or, or watching this, uh, if you have an artifact that you uh, would like to donate, give them a call and, uh, and see if it's something they can use. They can't use everything, uh, but they, um, now if you look, talk about a vehicle, uh, I have a guy sitting right here, the, uh, the uh, studios here of uh, Nissan uh, Universal Studios here. Uh, he'd be glad to work with you on uh, a vehicle. He's got a pretty good collection. But uh, I keep telling John I'm going to quit interrupting, but uh, I'm not. So keep right on doing, John. Well, uh, if uh, he was uh, found a vehicle that he could not store, we'd even be uh, possibly interested in putting it on our front uh, stoop. Uh, actually, right now, I'd love to find a, an artillery piece from the Vietnam era uh, for our our front uh, placement. We have a currently have a um, Civil War era cannon from Fort Fisher, but I think a nice counterpoint would be a, a good uh, 105 or uh, 155 howitzer out there. So if you got one of those in your backyard, yep. give us a call and we'll, be, uh, we'll make arrangements to go pick it up and bring it and bring it and put it on at the at the museum. I'd imagine your deuce and a half would work for that, wouldn't it? <laughs> All right. Um, go ahead. I, I won't interrupt you again. But uh, you're working on uh, the World War One uh, mm -hmm. exhibit and the Vietnam exhibit. Uh, by the way, on March 16th, we'll be going to do a, uh, a symposium there at the museum, and it's going to be the similarities and differences. That's from the Vietnam War, Gulf War One, Gulf War Two. In Afghanistan, uh, there's quite a bit of differences, but at the same time, there's a quite a few uh, similarities uh, with uh, rules of engagement and, uh, and deployment and so forth. So we invite you to come down to that. It'll be in the evening from 7 to 9 o'clock. And then let's see, March 21st to that whole week, we'll be doing the Vietnam experience there mm -hmm. at, the, at the museum. Coming down, we'll have helicopters and vehicles, weapons, uh, wall, uniforms, and so forth, uh, which John is trying his best to get. Um, yep, and uh, we're looking forward to hosting that with you guys. It's, yes. uh, it's a nice annual event that uh, brings a bunch of people into the museum and uh, and gets people uh, interested in both the the association but also the um, the museum itself. Uh, it's it's really nice to, to get to talk with Vietnam vets and see, see their... Um, um, Thoughts and memories of, of the uh, conflict, as well as the collection that uh, Mike brings in every year, and uh, and this just in, 105 uh, or 1905 uh, Springfield bayonet. Is this something that you have lying around? Is this something that? Well, we're this is possibly uh, something we we could look at. It uh, looks very interesting. We'll we'll talk about that. Hold it in front of the camera so people know what you're talking about. So. Oh, there it is. Oh, okay. we have it. Have the actual bayonet here. The uh, the scales look like they uh, are not here anymore. But it's in very nice condition. That's very cool. Same World War One. Very very nice. Well, we'll have to talk more about that. You talk about. <laughs> Wow, aren't you very nice? Somebody right. gave it to me. <laughs> we'll see how fast that worked right there. Well, this is this is how you get uh, artifacts. Yes. The first thing you have to do is ask for it. Yep. Yeah. You, don't and, have, you didn't have to ask for that one. It, it came out. We're just uh, talking about artifacts, and true. it just came right out of the blue. Just uh, Well, and I know, you know, as you mentioned, uh, footlockers. My dad has a footlocker in his closet. And, uh, you know, I don't know how often he goes into it, but uh, I know it's been there a long time. And uh, he's got all of his collection of Vietnam stuff in it. Um, the ubiquitous tire sandals and uh, um, his uh, Mark III fighting knife and and uh, actually the Zippo that my grandfather carried with the big red one in World War II. Mm -hmm. uh, he carried that in Vietnam for, him, for himself um, as a, uh, a lucky charm because it got, got my grandfather through uh, um, his efforts north of the Battle of the Bulge. Mm -hmm. So... Um, it is, uh, it's always a pleasure to, to, to see the artifacts that people thought were important enough to save and, and bring home. Uh, and uh, I'm always pleased to hear the stories behind them and to, to talk to the veterans. Um, you know, I, I always feel that, uh, you know, the family is the best place for these artifacts, but, uh, you know, sometimes you're looking for a long-term home for, 
for things that uh, the family isn't interested in or or uh, hasn't uh, hasn't worked out. So uh, that's what the museum is there for, is to hold those memories for the, the rest of North Carolina and their staff. Yeah, sometimes just to upkeep and keeping the thing so that it's in a condition to be to be seen and so forth and not go bad, someplace like the museum would be uh, a, a great place to have it. And uh, you can still, like I said, you can still go by and see it and, and, and take your mm -hmm. friends and so forth and go, that's that's the piece that I loan to the museum uh, and so forth. It's And that way they'll maintain it and, and make sure that it stays uh, in as good a shape as it can be. Uh, they don't want to get rusty or, or whatever. So. Yep. Uh, and, and actually, uh, you know, even the things that aren't on display, we often will make available to folks. Uh, I have the family of a uh, person that we feature in our Call to Arms exhibit coming in, in uh, May of next year. Uh, they are doing a family reunion kind of based around visiting the artifacts that are of the service of their um, uh, loved one. And uh, so we're going to gather together the things that uh, aren't on display. We actually have a couple things of hers on display. Uh, but the rest will be put on a cart and, and brought out for the, the family to see. And so that's that's one of the other services we, we often will make access for um, as uh, the things that uh, people don't ever don't get to see all, every day. I got a, I got a, a Civil War question to ask you. Mm. I'm, I'm listening. Sherman came through Raleigh. He didn't burn Raleigh. He burned all every place else as he came to. Why didn't he burn Raleigh? I believe because... He was met before he got to Raleigh, and uh, and and Raleigh capitulated before they they got here. That was that was a story I heard. Uh, uh, Sam, uh, senior moment. I can't remember Sam's last name. Sam Townsend uh, probably knew more about the Capitol building than anybody mm -hmm. I'd ever met before he, he's passed. But they used to uh, lead tours and so forth. There, he was an expert. But that's kind of what what he saw that. Uh, uh, North Carolina capital was spared because they had uh, uh, said the city is yours if you uh, uh, don't burn it. And, uh, of course, the big city been there that they burn it. But anyway, yep. uh, no, none of the, none of the uh, uh, Union soldiers got shot at or treated badly, so uh, they spared the city and so forth. When you are um, doing this, uh, well, just talk about the Vietnam exhibit and so forth. I know that uh, we have several members who have some fantastic uh, paraphernalia themselves mm -hmm. who uh, we'd like to uh, get donated and so forth. But uh, uh, it will tell it will tell the story uh, of the Vietnam War and the North Carolinians. If uh, out there, if you lost someone in, in the war, it's uh, and you have some uh, information about them, that would be uh, possibly a, a good exhibit uh, of some of the people mm -hmm. whose names on the wall. Or whatever. So well, uh, you know, to paraphrase uh, Donald Drumsfeld, uh, you can only go to exhibit with the artifacts you have, not the artifacts you want. Mm -hmm. So um, for us, the only exhibit we can put on display are, are the artifacts that we have. Uh, and so there are a lot of stories out there, but they're very hard to teach and very hard to, to convey without some sort of information or photographs or or um, letters or physical artifacts. Um, we have a neat collection that I brought in last year from a gentleman called uh, named uh, Alfred Fowler, who was a artilleryman with the 82nd. Um, and we have access over at the archives to all of the letters that his wife and he sent back and forth to each other uh, during his service. And so we also have about 40 photos of, of himself and his wife um, during that time period. So. Not only do we have some of his uniforms and a uh, boonie hat and his medals and, and some other things, but we also have some, some neat uh, uh, insight into his service through those, those letters and photographs. And so some people don't um, look at them, you know, when they, they look at their own photographs or their own letters and, and a, a, attach any value to them, but to us they're invaluable to help tell stories like this. Now you have, um, each year usually have a series of photographs uh, that was taken by a Vietnam vet mm -hmm. on display there, and there's some fantastic photos. Uh, that uh, you're probably thinking of an exhibit that we've put out before called A Thousand Words. Yes. Uh, which uh, started as a uh, Winston Salem veteran effort to gather photos about the local uh, veterans in that area, and it, it blossomed from there and turned into a larger exhibit. 
Um, it has traveled the state and traveled nationally. Uh, we've hosted it at our museum a couple times now, and uh, we are actually looking at, at bringing that one back out because of uh, popular demand. And I, I do not have a date on that one specifically, but it is on our exhibit schedule to come back out. And uh, that, in its uh, basic form, is about 60 framed photos of uh, the of neat pictures of people's memories of Vietnam and the friends that they had and the, experience, the positive experiences that they had through those friends. Uh, it's a very positive exhibit that um, I unfortunately haven't been able to even get my dad to, to come down and see. And that's, next time it comes back out, I'm going to try and get him down here. because It's, it's one of those, those uh, it's, you know, pictures of a guy standing next to his best buddy in Vietnam, and they're covered in mud and, and just smiling like crazy. And, uh, you know, they just caught him at the right moment. And, uh, and a lot of them are just stories like that. It's not the tough the memories that people have, but it's the good ones of their friends and mates uh, in the trenches. And there's about 17,000 Vietnamese live here in the Triangle area. Mm -hmm. uh, a large portion of them were former uh, South Vietnamese military. Mm. Uh, very strong group here. Uh, in fact, one of my good friends was, uh, when Saigon fell, he fought on for another 30 days. Uh, until he completely ran out of ammunition, he tells me he went from machine gun to 10 years in a slave labor camp. Mm. Uh, would that be something, uh, and they've settled in North Carolina now, mm -hmm. so they have North Carolina tie. Uh, uh, there were rangers and, and inspect, there were special forces uh, type of, of the Vietnamese mm. uh, and so forth. Uh, any paraphernalia or, or uh, souvenir or items they might have, would that be something that you could also? Certainly. Um, uh, we've uh, actually, um, both the Hmong and the Montagnards have settled in North Carolina in significant numbers. Uh, and we actually have uh, just recently, uh, through uh, Dr. Jean Marie Warseski, one of the other curators at the museum, uh, secured some Hmong um, artifacts and, and trade goods that were from Vietnam. Uh, for and, those, yeah, and those will end up being an exhibit at some yeah. point as well. For those of you uh, watching don't know what it, we were talking about, Hmongs were the uh, Vietnamese and Cambodians mixed some... Boy, uh, they were indigenous they, to, uh, to Vietnam, and also the... Uh, uh, in the mountainous the, regions. In the mountain yards and the mountains. Yep. In fact, the, uh, uh, the mountain yards were so important to special forces, some of them have bought land in North Carolina down around the zoo where it's almost like the central highlands of uh, uh, Vietnam, except it gets a lot colder there. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they have the, they live in their village. Basically, the village is there. Uh, the the uh, mountain yards or mountain people uh, are very uh, tribal oriented still, but uh, the special forces, because that was the greatest ally the special forces basically had. Uh, the Mongs also work with the special forces. So that's uh, two groups of people who fought in the Vietnam War and fought very well with the Americans, but don't get a whole lot of recognition because most people don't understand uh, who they were and, and so forth. When we first got to Vietnam, the Montagnards were basically like the American Indian. Uh, the uh, men wore loincloths. The women wore a little less, a little uh, were topless. They used crossbows uh, and sticks and rocks and everything else to, uh, to hunt and survive. Uh, an American who uh, went in and recruited them, actually uh, lived here in North Carolina for a while. Uh, Paul Campbell was a medic, and he went in and uh, helped the uh, tribal chief's daughter get well along with the uh, medicine man. And he was recruited to Mountain Yards uh, uh, to fight for the uh, United States, and which was hard to do because the Mountain Yards were always treated really bad by the South Vietnamese. And the idea was to get these people uh, trained and to fight, realizing that uh, they were fighting for people that hated them, uh, which were the South Vietnamese. And South Vietnamese tried to not have the Montagnards given weapons because they were afraid they would turn the weapons on them at the end of the war and so forth. So that uh, that's uh, two groups of people who live uh, here in North Carolina, have settled in North Carolina. Uh, who deal with special forces and so forth. So there's a lot of tie-ins with uh, in the state, uh, with Fort Bragg, uh, Seymour Johnson, uh, Cherry Point, Havelock with the Marines and so forth. A lot of ties here with uh, a lot of Vietnam vets live in the state. 
and it's important that uh, their story gets told uh, and so forth, and that's what John is uh, uh, working so hard to do. And uh, I've always liked history, and it, it, it sounds like you've got a job that would be absolutely fantastic. Uh, uh, I'm not saying that you'd go for it if it won't pay you, but <laughs> it sounds like it's a uh, it's an interesting job. Uh, the staff has always been good to work with down there. So, well, it's it is a, it's a very neat place to work, and it's always challenging because it's never the same thing twice. Uh, we are always uh, learning new things and and uh, and coming up with the ways to display them in, in a, a way that people find them interesting as well as uh, educational. Um, so it, it is a very gratifying place to work, especially the, the work with the veterans. Uh, I, I find that tremendously rewarding, uh, talking to, to people who have served and, and, uh, and hearing the stories of their, their uh, trials and tribulations. Yeah, An exhibit I'd like to see would be an exhibit of the Montagnards making their wine. Mm. Uh, that stuff it will come out and grab you and and beat you up when you don't even know where it's coming from. <laughs> I've heard the stories uh, of it from the or uh, making of nuke folks. mom. Nuke mom is uh, is a fish sauce that Vietnamese used, mm. and finding a container that it wouldn't eat up was it's always hard. Uh, but it's made of uh, well, they call it fermented fish, but mm -hmm. if you know how it's made, it's basically a rotten fish. But it goes on everything. You can mm -hmm. smell it for. Uh, miles and miles away, but that'd be a, a, a great display in, in, of, uh, of making it, uh, just to stay, always stay upwind from it. But uh, Might need to be a taste test. Uh, yeah, uh, well, uh, I can get you some. Well, most of what they sell at Vietnamese restaurants here <laughs> is the nice and thin, clear stuff, mm -hmm. but over there it was that deep, I mean, thick, thick sauce that, uh, well, it goes on, on a little bit of everything. But, uh, so is there a deadline for people to get you this this uh, materials or uh, basically any time? I mean, you got to have time to plan it for the exhibit and so forth. So. Well, certainly the earlier the better. Um, we haven't really set the deadlines hard on the Vietnam exhibit yet. Um, but uh, as these things develop, we'll be allocating space to the things we know we have. And so that's really how things will um, kind of lay out from there. Uh, the... Uh, the Vietnam experience, uh, you know, it may take a little while for people to, to get the word out that, that we are looking, but uh, but right now is the time to, to start thinking about Well, that's about what we're doing right now. We're exactly. going to let a whole bunch of people. Let me ask you this. Uh, if someone gives an artifact to the museum, is there is it a tax deduction or uh, is it just out of the goodness of their heart or just? Well, um, it is uh, what we try to arrange or what are called gifts, which is a, um, a complete ownership change mm -hmm. so that we own the things yeah um, of course we we try not to do long-term loans or, or short-term loans because they're they get complicated um, uh, as people see things in museums sometimes other family members can can get involved with it and it, it can get messy um, so so we are looking for for those things to be secured as, as permanent gifts uh, and the value of those things would have to be established by an outside appraiser uh, the museum is not allowed to set um, prices mm -hmm. on things like this because that has a conflict of interest. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but yes, they ultimately could be considered tax deductible, uh, and so they uh, they would be able to write that off on taxes. So uh, listen, those of you out there who need a tax deduction, uh, January is coming up pretty soon. Uh, this may be the time to open those foot lockers and get in those duffel bags because uh, John needs it. Yep, and uh, you know we were looking for um, a little bit of everything, specifically things like flak jackets or tiger stripe camouflage, uh, zippos with unit insignias on them, um, things re related to ha the helicopter rescue uh, missions or long range patrols, uh, just about anything that you can think of that would describe North Carolina's veterans' daily life in Vietnam. Um, so. If it if it covers that, we are interested. Okay, uh, so it's out there. We have given you the challenge out there now to get get him that stuff. Let's make it really hard. They're gonna have so much stuff. They're gonna have to figure out where to put all of it in the exhibit. So let's give let's give him some job to do. We're gonna get him so many artifacts out there. He's not gonna know what how to display it all. But that's that's a good problem that we're to give him, and uh, and so forth. So. Uh, I know there's a lot of you out there. Uh, Vietnam is getting more and more interested uh, out there because of the culture. Uh, for some reason, everybody wants to be a Vietnam vet. Uh, all information, I, I think, is part of the uh, exhibit should be 
uh, war protests is also because that was a very important part. So if you've got some uh, posters that you used uh, to protest the war or troops or whatever, I I'm certain they could find a place for that And uh, because uh, that's all part of the war, the music, mm -hmm. uh, the rock and roll, uh, country drilling the fish, and th those songs are all protests in the war. Uh, that's as part of the war as much as anything. So it's out there. Well, and, and you're right. The uh, you know conscientious objector story or something like that is is an angle that we we have covered in other conflicts. We have a uh, a, um, a uh, medical person from the uh, 30th that was a conscientious objector was not willing to uh, be involved with combat arms, so they were able to give him a, a job as a medic uh, as his uh, as his role. And it's something that we could certainly cover in Vietnam if we if we found the right things. Well, there's always there's always next year's exhibit. Of course, yep. uh, you know, it's it's probably going to continue right on. We uh, we will have the etchings in stone play uh, down there again for those who have not had a chance to see it. We'll be sure to want to come by and see it. And if you saw it before, you need to come back and see it. It was uh, it was recorded in high definition. It looks it actually looks better now than it did from the from the people on the stage. Well, uh, I really enjoyed it last year. It was a very powerful uh, portrayal, uh, and I thought very cleverly done and uh, and very cleverly um, presented with the set. Uh, as a, an exhibit designer by trade, I found a lot of that stuff very fascinating. Um, it, I really impressed with all the actors and the way they did it, and I'm I'm really glad that they filmed it because. Getting that many people together to do that every year has got to, would have to be a challenge. Well, I appreciate what you said about actors. They want actors. They were living their parts. Uh, mm -hmm. Almost everybody up there w w their, who did their part lived that part uh, in some way or the other. And it showed. Um, and the, um, by the way, Etchings in Stone is available. We will put it on the road. Uh, if you have a group that would like to see it, uh, contact uh, me uh, through uh, NCBI. Lessons of Vietnam, ncvi.org, and uh, let me know. I, we might can uh, take the, take the uh, film to you. Uh, we've got just a couple more minutes left. But, uh, John, uh, what's, uh, what, are you, what, is, what are you planning on now as uh, the future continuing staying at the museum and uh, doing uh, exhibits like this? What can we do as North Carolina Vietnam veterans to make it a little easier for you or get more information out? Because your exhibits sometimes don't get the words out that mm. that's there. It's that's always a challenge for us, and I know it's for y'all too to get the word out to the people that you are looking for artifacts and the exhibits. You've had some really good exhibits over the years on uh, on Vietnam as well as uh, other uh, military history and so forth. How can we get the word out uh, to uh, people? Uh, I guess word of mouth, like we're kind of yep. doing right now. Word of mouth is the, the best way to, to let people know that we're uh, out there. We have a limited uh, press budget, so we don't do a great deal of print media. Um, we do a, a little bit more electronic media these days as, as things are, are shifting that way. Uh, but uh, we find that, that our visitors and our supporters are the probably the best advertisement that we have. Um, and, uh, and them telling friends, families, dragging people to the museum on, on their off days uh, is, is one of the ways that, that uh, people show up and go, well, gosh, I didn't even know this was here. It's like, well, wow, we've been trying. Yeah, I'm kind of partial to the Vietnam War. Uh, and the lifestyle uh, of the 60s, you got to remember the 60s, the turbulent 60s, we had civil rights, women's rights, voting rights, rock and roll, hippies, uh, the dr the way we dress, war protests. Uh, how many war protests you saw in World War II, Korea, World War One, out carrying protest signs? All that stuff was going on, and it's got, got its own history. So the Vietnam War is a very important aspect of the way we live today. Uh, the music we listen to, our entertainment, our lifestyles, basically uh, got their roots back in the in the uh, late fifties, early sixties and early 70s. So exhibits like this are uh, very important for our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren uh, to be able to see what life was out uh, back then. If you may be too young to remember the Vietnam War, uh, bless your heart, uh, <laughs> as a Southern is saying, but uh, uh, come down and uh, see the exhibits and enjoy it. And uh, if you, if you 
uh, lucky you might have John to, uh, there to, to uh, answer questions and so forth. He will be he will be with Mike doing the uniforms mm -hmm. uh, when we do the uh, Vietnam experience down at the museum. So uh, again, I'm gonna reach out to you. I'm not begging you. I'm just telling you that if you've got some uh, possibility of some uh, items of the Vietnam War. Uh, don't let them go bad. Uh, put them where there can be some use for a lot of people to enjoy them and a lot of education. That's the one thing the North Carolina History Museum is number one uh, thing is to educate the public about the men and women of North Carolina, uh, how we got to where we are. Uh, we must be a fairly good state because we uh, a lot of people are moving here. If you don't think so, get out on 440 doing at about <laughs> rush hour traffic and see. Uh, a lot of history in this state, going back, as we said before, before the, before the uh, Revolutionary War. And they're collecting all of that and this one little building. Uh, it can't always be on display, but they have, they have specials coming up, as you, uh, we just talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a couple. You have some uh, on the Indians, uh, the early Indians, and uh, some of the housing and so forth that are on display almost all the time. Yes, that's correct. That's uh, that's in our uh, Story of North Carolina exhibit, basically the timeline of uh, history of, of the state uh, in the beginning of that, and that, that's covered. Um, and then we move on quickly to the regulator era of, uh, of the uh, state. You have a nine name, you also have some race cars down there, I believe. Uh, we do, uh, we currently have uh, Dale Earnhardt's uh, race car on display in our lobby, um, and, uh, or one of them, I should say. And we also have Richard Petty's up in the uh, Sports Hall of Fame. You know, I find that the people from out of town are more likely to go to, uh, to the museum than people who live here uh, in Raleigh. A lot of people in Raleigh have never been to the Art Museum, to the Natural History Museum, unless an out-of-town visitor comes, then they came down. But I tell you, if you live here in Raleigh, you owe it to yourself to go to these uh, uh, venues, the Art Museum, the Natural History Museum, uh, uh, History Museum itself. All these things are absolutely fantastic, and it's something to be proud of. There's and, a there's a lot going on downtown these days, yeah. and uh, and a lot of uh, um, mutual interest. Uh, you know, great deal of restaurants are downtown that uh, weren't there a decade ago. Uh, as a state employee, you know, long term down there, we've really seen downtown change and and become much more interesting. There's a great deal more special events on weekends. Uh, you know, Harley uh, type things and. Uh, all sorts of really neat uh, music events as well. Mm -hmm. So generally, if you go downtown Raleigh on a weekend, you're going to run into something interesting, as well as the museum. Is the is the Raleigh Museum open? The uh, the, the city of Raleigh Museum. Yeah, the, it, it the is. Ones uh, downtown. I think that that is. Uh, I don't know their hours, but uh, they're good folks. I, I interact with them quite regularly, and and they've got some very interesting stuff. They've recently opened a World War II section. Uh, of theirs, but uh, it's a, it's a good place to learn Raleigh centric history. Mm -hmm. uh, we at the museum um, uh, are a broad spectrum North Carolina museum, so we're trying to cover the coast and the, the um, western portion as well as central, all in the same uh, breath, where they uh, can focus on on Raleigh itself. Yeah, the uh, in fact, uh, just going down and seeing Briggs Hardware mm -hmm. in the building is an experience in itself. It was, <coughs> excuse me. If it's not the oldest building in Raleigh, it's got to be right at the oldest building in it, Raleigh. It's one of them, um, yeah. and uh, it has a long history, and it's a, a really neat building architecturally. Yeah, and uh, we know it's a hardware store. It had uh, just about anything you wanted you could find in there. But um, history is such an interesting subject, and uh, uh, our next show, by the way, will be uh, Vietnam. Say what? Uh, it's kind of a light uh, story. It's going to be uh, different stories, uh, short stories. Uh, the uh, uh, the story of a man who uh, whose entire tour of Vietnam was 27 minutes. Uh, another man who was a POW and was kicked out of Vietnam because he was stupid. They said, even though he was really smart. Uh, the number one spy for the communists that worked for Time Magazine. Uh, it's those kind of stories. So uh, be sure to tune in for our next show, which will be two weeks from tonight, just before Christmas, I believe. I can't remember the date. But it's two weeks from tonight. Let's see. Tonight is uh, 14th. 14th? 28th. 28th. All right. So 28th, be sure and tune in and uh, and see that show. And uh, anytime that you have an idea that we can show and talk about and so forth, let us know. Uh, if you uh, can't find John, contact me. Uh, 
and let me know, and I'll get uh, up with John because uh, he's always trying uh, getting uh, stuff. Uh, the man it's, uh, lives at work day and night. By the way, you're a member of a local organization of, uh, of history buffs. Tell us a little bit about that real quick while we've still got some time. That's correct. I, I'm uh, on the board of the North Carolina Military um, Historical Society, uh, and we are a group of like-minded individuals interested in, in um, the stories of, of history of the military service in North Carolina. Kind of sounds like my day job. Um, but uh, we put on a symposium every year in, in uh, May, and uh, this year uh, it will be covering World War I, uh, as is timely currently, and uh, we will have about four different speakers covering the uh, mobilization and uh, early Americans uh, in service in World War I, as well as uh, other very interesting uh, portions of that. Uh, and we will also be doing that again next year, covering World War I and the service of North Carolinians in, in the, uh, the trenches. Uh, we also put up several publications a year uh, covering other interested uh, portions of, uh, of, of the history. And uh, so you can uh, find us on, online uh, under um, North Carolina Military Historical Society. What, what is the requirements to be a member? Uh, the only requirements is to submit a membership uh, fee of uh, twenty dollars and uh, and a little bit of paperwork to uh, to know where we send the uh, the uh, mailers. That sounds like a pretty pretty inexpensive route to uh, be able to get with a, a group of people and sit down and discuss history and so forth. I know there's a lot of people moving into Raleigh constantly, year after year, and uh, uh, a lot of them don't know about the these organizations like that. Would be a fantastic organization. So if they wanted a membership, they would go online and... Yep, and uh, and just, uh, I think the uh, email is kind of convoluted or the, the web address, so the best thing to do is just to actually Google North Carolina Military Historical Society. Or even better way, have a artifact and bring it to John, and he will help you get the application to fill it out. In fact, I have some of the applications in my office. Okay, so, so see how easy that was? You bring an artifact... You get something out of it, the museum gets something out of it, and then all of North Carolina gets to share in, in, in your riches and so forth. And I do have some of the periodicals that we send out uh, as as uh, examples so that uh, somebody can take home a, a little bit of North Carolina history in that. Yeah. Uh, by the way, if you're, if you're looking for North Carolina history to give to someone, uh, the History Museum has a fantastic uh, store there uh, where you can buy all kinds of uh Interesting things from North Carolina. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are some so very forth. good uh, reference books and, and other things uh, on our military history. We have a pretty good collection of uh, military-centric ties and other things as well. Um, and uh, so there's some good good Christmas gifts there. I, I often do some of my shopping there myself. Yeah. So basically what we're saying is learn more about the state you live in and help us uh, put the information out there to other people so they can know more about the state we live in. Uh, why is the state called the Tar Heel State? Uh, lots of uh, out there. More information about Carbane Williams. Uh, the you also have the uh, Sports uh, Hall of Fame there, I believe, in the museum. Uh, with some interesting uh, people listed in there. Yep, that's correct. Uh, uh, the North Carolina uh, Sports Hall of Fame agency or a, a group has uh, space in our museum that that we host uh, that in, and uh, so there are some very interesting things. Even something from Michael Jordan. Yeah, that, I think he played basketball, didn't he? Somewhere. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you again for tuning in. Looking forward to seeing you. Uh, Sunday. Oh, Sunday. Okay. Yes, I knew. I thought I had already said that, but I guess I didn't. It's a good thing my producer, director, and whatever uh, keeps me straight. This Sunday, which will be the 18th of December, 2016. North Carolina Vietnam Veterans and other veterans organizations will be coming together at the State Capitol Vietnam Memorial, and we'll be holding a uh, our annual Christmas lighting of luminaries where we call out the names and light a luminary for each person of the 39 plus some uh, some other special people. But come join us. This is 6 o'clock. Uh, we'll have all kinds of information there and, and entertainment. We're going to have a choir there. We're going to have... Uh, uh, Bob White playing bagpipes in his kilt, uh, which is always interesting in cold weather. Hopefully it's not uh, windy. Uh, we're going to have, uh, we're playing taps. We're going to be um, 
let's see. Well, oh, we're going to have a special presentation by Eric Cantu from Kinston, who's coming just to be able to do his special missing man table. Uh, if you've never, if you've seen a missing man table, you probably have never seen one quite like he does it. You need to come join us. Uh, dress warm. I don't think it's going to be anywhere near as cold as it normally is. But at six o'clock, North Carolina State Capitol, Vietnam Memorial, uh, and come down and get a name and call out the name and light and light one of the luminaries. Uh, again, uh, that's it for right the moment. Did, did I figure anything else? It, uh, senior moments kind of catch up with me sometimes. Oh, but that's the show, and appreciate it, and y'all have a good one. You're tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section on nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Atomos.com, makers of quality video recorders and converters, CarolinaApparel.com, and DeltaForce.net.